I, I want to start off by saying thank you to Urvashi and everyone at Consumer Reports for including me in this event. It's really an honor to rub elbows with today's speakers, not, less, not least these three gentlemen. We're really rubbing elbows today. Um, <laughs> It's also an honor to be involved really in any way in, uh, with a group that's so well respected as Consumer Reports um, by such a wide audience from um, my fairly liberal friends and colleagues all the way to my ultra conservative uncles. You guys are really well respected across the board and use that platform in such bold and important ways. Over the past century or so, um, I think we should have a, a slide coming out. There we go. Um, over the past century or so, tremendous growth in the meat industry has led to some troubling um, production practices. So it was not so very long ago that um, most farms looked like the one on the slide that you're looking at now. But over the past century or so, uh, tremendous growth in the meat industry has led to some troubling production practices. Uh, those practices would include unnatural diets geared toward the maximum growth of animals over the shortest period of time, overcrowded conditions that are often um, pretty filthy, and as a result, routine antibiotics fed to animals, also used as growth promoters, but, but substantially to um, cover up for these overcrowding, stressful situations. And that overcrowding also leads to an excess of animal waste that typically runs off into waterways. So there are a lot of problems. <clears throat> and at the same time that this tremendous growth in the industry happened, fewer and fewer people, regular people, came to raise animals, either for um, commercial purposes or for personal reasons, uh, or for personal consumption. And so to kind of take a figurative analogy and, and bring it into the literal, the average American knows very little about how the sausage really gets made anymore. Um, from Upton Sinclair's The Jungle to Eric Schlosser's Fast Food Nation and the film Food Inc., there have been tons of efforts to lend greater transparency to the food industry and um, lots of great groups also working in this space. Consumer Reports uh, specifically has done an incredible job of alerting the public to the issues surrounding modern meat production, <clears throat> not um, including arsenic in chicken and the misuse of antibiotics in meat production. And um, two big things that we've learned from the recent polling, and these are not totally surprising, but number one is that people care a lot about the food that they eat and the ways that it's produced. And number two, most people are totally confused because there are so many labels out there and so many of them don't mean what you think they mean. We're gonna get into this a little bit, but this isn't, I don't think this is an accident. And as Tara Duggan mentioned this morning, um, industry tends to co-opt the language that um, is be being used to communicate the things that are most important to consumers. So my name is Leslie Hatfield, and I work for the Grace Communications Foundation, a New York-based nonprofit that educates consumers around food, water, and energy issues. Um, we're probably best known for The Matrix, a short animated spo spoof on the Matrix films that we put out in 2003. That film's been seen about, a, about 10 million times around the country, or around the world. And um, if you haven't seen them, I would definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, we also produce Sustainable Table, an online encyclopedia-style resource that educates consumers about the problems around industrial livestock farming and also as a place to kind of celebrate more sustainable forms of agriculture. We also run an online directory of farms, farmers markets, restaurants, and retail outlets that sell locally produced and sustainably grown food. <clears throat> That's the Eat Well Guide. It's at eatwellguide.org, and I would also encourage you to check that out. Um, so I've been working with Grace and its partners for about eight years to educate the um, public around the problems with industrial meat production and also to promote this, the alternative, which I think a lot of people would actually be surprised still totally exists. This smaller scale, less resource intensive, less polluting, higher welfare, local and sustainable meat products. Um, when I started out at Grace uh, in 2006, I was actually a vegetarian um, because I had read Fast Food Nation. I was um, a big environmentalist and I was worried about our meat system. I was very wary. And 
in the course of my work, I got to tour quite a few farms um, where the producers were really doing it right. And in the end, I actually started eating meat again, um, not least because I felt better about, about those products, but also because I really wanted to support those farmers. Um, <clears throat> Everyone from vegans to flexitarians to paleo dieters, we all have a huge stake in a healthy and transparent food system. At Grace, we encourage people to vote with their forks, but without being able to make informed choices, without strong labeling, that's impossible. So I want to start off with um, Will Witherspoon all the way to my left. Uh, Will Witherspoon is one of those farmers that I'm talking about. He's also a former St. Louis Rams linebacker. He's a current ESPN commentator, and he is the owner of Shiregate Farm in Owensville, Missouri. Will is really the best kind of farmer. Um, we know from data released by Consumer Reports that appetite for his type of product is very high across the board. Um, recently, Will signed a deal with Delanor Delaware North, one of the largest concession companies in the world, to sell his product at um, the Edward Jones Dome in St. Louis so, um, so that football fans can go to the game and have a, a burger or a hot dog that's produced under some of the highest, um, highest welfare production <coughs> standards. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> this is a big deal. So, um, Will, tell us a little bit about your farm and the, and the products that you produce there. Well, I guess the uh, first thing is everybody always asks me how I get involved. How did I start this? Um, of course, being a professional athlete, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest keys we always try to figure out is you are what you eat. You are kind of what you put into your body. And I've never been a supplement guy because that's a totally unregulated industry, right? And uh, when I bought my first piece of property for my horses, I went out to get some cows and said, hmm. I came, went to get two, came home with 16, figured I better start learning how to raise cattle. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that, that is kind of what has led me there. That's kind of the general pathway that's brought me to where I am today, understanding how to, how to raise animals, how to treat them, how, you know, from hoof to plate, essentially, we can improve everything that's, that's been put in, in front of us. I mean, everybody understands and everybody looks at it and goes, how can we make this better? How, why does it have to be as such? You know, we all know about feedlots. We all know about, uh, you know, subtherapeutic use of antibiotics. But how can we do it better? Well, the first thing I always did is I started with myself. and like, what would I like? What would I truly want to have on my plate at the end of the day? I've got three amazing daughters who always enjoy spending time out at the farm as well with me. and. My oldest is always up at you know crack of dawn to go go to the hen house and get eggs, regardless. But when I when I look at what I've done with Shiregate, it's partly to not only encourage you know others to create sustainable farms and enrich sustainable farms, but also to make these products available to the consumer at what really a price point that can be, you know reached by many and, and grow because I think everybody looks at it and says oh that's just an elitist ideal uh oh well we're lost but anyway uh, everybody looks at it as an elitist ideal oh well, there we go we're back in and how you can you know produce a product at a reasonable cost that's beneficial for all there's that's a you know some of the main focuses that I've always had for Shargate is to produce a great product for every consumer at a reasonable price and value. And you know, this, this, or, this structure that we've had with the dome has been a great kind of kickoff point for it. It's been a seven year project just to get to that for me. But uh, going forward, you know, there's, there's still many, many things I wanna do to enrich the lives of the farmers, the sustainable farmers that I'm working with already currently, and the many more that I wanna work with in the future. That's great. Um, so, and, and Will, can you just kind of talk for a second about how specifically, so your animals are raised on pasture um, without Yeah, yeah okay, well, all of, all on the farm, I have about, you know, seven, eight hundred acres. 
So on the farm, I raise all the animals in small herds. We keep them, essentially keep them in a small herd, no more than about 100 to 50, 100 to 150 animals on the property, as far as the cattle are concerned. Um, this allows for a lot of great sustainable ideals. It allows me to rotate the pastures well. It also allows me to make sure that the animals aren't confined in you know, nose to nose, or, or as you'd like to call it, or and transferring any kind of illnesses that are available. Um, all raised under, as Andrew, Andrew will explain later, the animal welfare approved label, which their grass fed label is, is you know the strongest I've seen. At a, and for the again for the consumer that allows me a third party that is looking into everything I do to certify that. Um, Going forward there, you know, when you talk about antibiotics use and everything else, the AWA does allow antibiotics, but more importantly, it's the, the therapeutic level of usage, and then there's a significant drawdown period for that animal. Yeah. We'll get into that specifically a little bit later. So I'll move on and introduce Andrew Gunther. Um, Andrew is the director of Animal Welfare Approved, widely regarded as the gold standard of meat labeling. Um, <clears throat> Andrew, before taking over at AWA, he worked at Whole Foods, and he was also a poultry producer um, back in the UK where he designed and built the world's first certified organic um, breeder flock for chi chicken. Andrew brings a really unique perspective as a former producer and now a third party certifier. Um, he's also a marketer and a proponent for high welfare, environmentally sustainable meat production. Um, so, Andrew, can you talk a little bit about your program and what are the elements that make up, um, you know, truly, true animal welfare? Yeah, Leslie, thank you. I if I may, just to reiterate what an honor it is to be at an event hosted by Consumers Union and to be amongst such great luminaries of the, of the movement from somebody who I've grown to, to know quite well over the last five years, Will, right the way through to our panels this morning. But I just wanted to touch on something that's in the bottom of our goodie bag. If you wanted to take a look at it, it has two things written on it. It says fairness for animals, and the other said it says justice for farm workers. And in my own mind, sustainability has three tenets. You have to be fair to the planet, fair to the people, and fair to the animal. And I thought Avashi had made a mistake until I figured out it's renewable bamboo. <laughs> so in our, we have this to take home with us, which are the three tenets of true sustainability. And, and I want to address something really quickly. There is no such thing as cheap food. We hear it banded around, we heard it in a video earlier, where there is no such thing as cheap food. The price point you pay does not ever recognize the cost of production. That's my soapbox. <clears throat> so Animal Welfare Approved is a, an organization that's funded by uh, grant and donations, so we're entirely free at the point of delivery, and we run around the countryside with highly trained auditors, uh, identifying, auditing, and certifying farmers who are farming on pasture and range. At any one moment, we're working with about 2,000 farms across about 2.1 million acres across the US and Canada, and we've got some exciting news coming shortly with some uh, projects where we're going <clears> to <throat> partner with organizations across the planet to make a change. But one of our key tenants is the system. And it's important that we recognize that sustainability is a system. It's not a location. Tyson are local to somebody. St. Louis, the home of Monsanto, and there is a certain irony here as my ex-Rams colleague sits here and talks, Monsanto fund some of the greening projects that are going on in the St. Edward's Dome. So that's quite humorous that Will has his hot dogs. But we have to be really careful when we're designing labels and claims that they deliver what we want them to do. We're going to see label after label that's meaningless. But this is a project we can all get behind. Consumers Union can give us a win. If we destroy natural, get rid of it. Get that garbage off our labels. As consumers, we begin to take control of our food supply chain. And just to close it out, on behalf of every farmer that farms sustainably, 
genuinely, legitimately in the right way, whether they're certified organic, they're certified AWA, they're certified AGA, they're certified any one of those. I thank all of you in advance for what you're going to do in getting rid of natural. Thanks, Andrew. Moving on to um, Carter Dillard. Carter is the Director of Litigation for the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and Carter's been part of major lo uh, lawsuits in this area, including the removal of the completely meaningless label uh, Animal Care Certified that was on egg cartons between 2002 and 2005, and it's gone now. Uh, more recently, yes. <laughs> More recently, Carter and his team at AD ALDF have been pushing government agencies to enforce current re regulations, which actually call for full disclosure of egg production methods on cartons. So Carter, can you tell us a little bit about um, your work and what's going on on the legal front in animal welfare over the, over the past couple decades and, and especially more recently? Sure. Uh, well, it's, it's rare for me to be among folks like this because my clients, the animals, normally do everything they can to avoid these gentlemen on my, on my left and my right. <laughs> but um, the, the fact is our, our legal system is designed around democratic principles that require transparency in the marketplace and consumer participation. So if you had the ideal label, it would be a window into what the actual farm looked like and you'd see what was going on there. So when you think about the law, that is really what the law should, in its ideal form, require. The problem is that today there's rampant false advertising in the marketplace. I'll give you three quick examples. For a significant period of time, the only significant producer of foie gras, force-fed duck liver, was able to advertise their product as humane. While it causes the animal's liver to go eight to 10 times its normal size, so that the animals are literally dying of liver failure before they're slaughtered. That was advertised as humane. Situations where hens are crammed eight, 10, 12 at a time into a battery cage, so they each have the space of a piece of paper for about two years, and in some cases are starved or deprived of water to cause them to lay more eggs, that was advertised as a situation where the animals were being cared for. And that persisted before it was shot down by false advertising law. And uh, even here in the Bay Area, for a long time, a particular egg producer advertised using pictures of hens out in the field when, in fact, all of the birds were confined indoors. Uh, that was solved with false advertising law. So there's a lot, of, a lot of lack of transparency in the marketplace, and it's probably exemplified most of all by what are called ag-gag laws. These are laws being passed in, in several states that prohibit filming or photographing inside a factory farm. And in some places, doing so carries a greater penalty than actually committing animal cruelty. So factory farmers will do everything they can, in, including criminalizing uh, photographing inside facilities to hide, to close that window so that you can't see what's going on. And the good news is we're moving in the right direction. Uh, not only removing deceptive advertising, but moving towards requiring disclosures on products. Uh, and the court, probably the most important court, short of the Supreme Court, recently endorsed that move uh, by saying that the government had a significant interest in requiring uh, factual information on products, even when it was doing so beyond just eliminating deception. Uh, and I'll, I'll just close it out by saying there, there are, I think, a couple things that we ought to think about in the background of all of this discussion. One is, our historically labels have really only regarded what is in the product itself. That's what was considered important. But they've got to get to production process because that's really what matters for workers, for the environment, for animals. It, it matters a lot more than just what the product is itself. We also have to get over the hurdle of realizing that just because a government regulator says this is what something means, that suddenly that, pro that, that term is not misrepresentative. The only way that a term is going to be representative of the product is if consumers are actually seeing via whatever they interpret from that term is going on on the farm. So everyone, governments, uh, certifiers, courts, they've got to be aware of what consumers actually believe terms mean or it's not really going to work. And 
And I think the last thing I'd say is this, all of this represents a move away from an old system that really, I think, we're living in the shadow still of World War II, where famine, deprivation, uh, the need for massive production of calories at cost to every other value we have, is still, we're still living in that shadow. But the reality is, given things like climate change, animal cruelty, and the advent of small beneficial producers that are getting pushed out of the market by false advertising, we need to get out of that shadow and realize that we're beyond that threat and into the, the threat that mass production itself causes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I just want to quickly reiterate some of these best practices, um, which Will kind of talked about um, how he raises beef on his farm, and um, Andrew also touched on. But um, and we'll get into the antibiotics thing later. So in the in the center, we've got prudent drug use, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but um, also. Uh, prohibition on GMO feed, um, prohibition on toxic pesticides, on cages and crates, humane slaughter, humane transport, um, better breeds, um, sort of more natural breeds, uh, true free range, farm inspection, expen <laughs> inspections, that 30, third party certification piece is really important, um, and, and especially access to pasture. Um, so, uh, and Andrew, just very quickly, can you talk about the other benefits to raising animals in a high, higher welfare system? Yeah, for the, I mean, we just go back to this position where an animal is a sentient being, it's a biological being. And if you bring a biological being under stress, it starts to become ill. If you change the way the, the animal is, and we can do it any way you like, to grow more quickly, you compromise something else. So there is an optimum space for an animal to live, and that optimum space is to live without stress, to grow at the right pace, to live without fear, to be fed an optimum diet. And we have to be really careful of the word optimum here, because you can feed an animal in the same way as I fed myself a year ago on a diet of of, that wasn't optimal and I put on 60 pounds. We do that to our livestock. Yeah, I've, I've lost 60 now and, and I feel a lot better for it. Um, but my point being is, is biological beings are designed or evolved to be one way. So if a ruminant, i.e. a cow or a goat or a sheep that is designed to live on grass or browse, browse being stuff in the trees, and you then feed it grain, you're making the animal sick. And we heard from Will earlier, and, and you know, I can quote Will anytime you like, food is Will's medicine. As a top flight for sports person, he cared what he ate. He cared so much, he decided to take full control of what he ate. We can do that. But the animal, too, reacts to being fed poorly. If you have a, an animal that's used to having space uh, uh, and lots of different animals have different reactions, Galeus Galeus, which is the jungle fowl or the chicken, has a mind that says, I actually don't want to be near too many people. I like a small group of friends. So what the industry did was bring in 30,000 of its closest friends and <laughs> pack them in a building and then said, oh my goodness, they've all got sick. So there is a direct correlation between how you keep an animal and how that animal feels about being kept. And I'm not going to get into the, the conversation about to kill an animal or not. That's a moral decision. But we have a moral obligation to raise that animal in a way that doesn't put it under stress, that doesn't make it sick, and doesn't make our planet sick. And I hope I haven't waffled too much, but there is a direct correlation between how you keep the animal and how the animal is. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the labeling landscape, because as you can see on this slide, it's pretty complicated. Um, as you see, uh, Andrew's is one of the, it's really, again, the, the gold standard. Um, <clears throat> it, 
let's talk about the value of these meaningful labels. Um, Will, as a producer, what's the value for you of being AWA certified? And, and similarly, I mean, you're also a consumer of, of products, right? So as a parent as an, and as an athlete, um, can you talk about the value of transparency there too? Well, transparency is key to my entire existence. As we talked about being an athlete, my entire life is online. Everything that I do or will do is available for all to see. So that transparency for me, when I took this into business, is the same is the same approach. It has to have give someone the ability to see what choices I would be making and should be making, and consistently do so. You know, if I chose to raise animals conventionally, then it should be known that those animals were raised conventionally. You know, when I found the AWA seal and went through their process, I mean, the, uh, as I initially started this farm, I had no idea what I was doing. I had a uh, of one product on my farm that I had to just go ahead and get rid of. It was at the time I bought a bunch of chickens for the kids, bought feed at the feed store, you know, just general things like that. But that was the one, you know, the one strike I had against me, which to say the least, I was actually really surprised about because I had no idea again where I'd start. So again, transparency in, in the marketplace is huge. You know, I, we were just talking about, you know, uh, the welfare of the animal, and we always talk about what, what it's like to think about, hmm, my, you know, we all talk about cold season and going forward. Well, that's the same thing it is with you, when you can find those animals. Well, if my label doesn't tell you that I'm confining these animals in together, then it should tell you that these animals are be, being raised in an environment where they can roam freely, where they can be seen, and it should be understandable to the consumer. At the end of the day, I want to know what, what I'm reading and I want to understand what it is. Because I can tell you now, half the stuff that's on a lot of labels out there, unless most of us were really, really good chemists, you probably don't understand it. That's right. That's right. And, and Carter, um, should conventional farmers be also certified as according to animal welfare and production practices? Should, or should they be required to disclose those practices? I think either. I think one or the other for, for certain. The consumers can't always get to the farm and see where their food is coming from. Sometimes you can if you're trying to, to target local production. But if, if you can't do that, then you're going to rely on a third party certifier like Animal Welfare Approved uh, to, to audit and make sure that what's being said and the standards that are, are being pronounced are being adhered to. So you have to do that. But if at the very least, if producers are not willing to be certified by that standard, then the government has got to step in and require that that sort of transparency is still there. Uh, because they will take, they'll take advantage of consumers, whether through price or through misleading labeling, um, when they're not forced to be held to a standard. Right. All right, moving on. Um, can we get the next slide? Oh, great. Um, so this is really interesting. Um, I, I hope that you can all see the details on this slide because um, there are five principles here. Um, farm inspected to verify claims, minimum living space uh, requirements, animals uh, were slaughtered humane, humanely, um, they went outdoors, and they were raised without cages. Um, and across the board here, over 50%, but up to 80% of people um, believed that the label humane speaks to these principles. Um, spoiler, spoiler, it does not. Um, it, even more people, up to 90, 92%, think that the label should mean it. Um, and again, in reality, this label means none of these things. And as Elisa said this morning, um, you know, this is really a claim without any substance at all. So, um, Andrew, having been a producer, and you know, now your job is to kind of help differentiate these higher quality products. Um, can you talk about um, how labeling can help people understand and 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 talk talk about humane? This humane label. This one. Oh, this is tremendous. Um, where do you want me to start? If I start with the word garbage <laughs> and end with the word misleading and then put garbage at the end of it, I think we've actually got it. Well, so let's start with... Uh, oh, hello. 
Is that the police? They've come to get me. I've parked in the wrong place. <laughs> How many of us think that our chicken that we eat is raised in a cage? Do we think the chicken we eat, the actual yeah. bird meat the time that we eat? Yeah. Well, the answer is it's not. That there is no system that you have caged, raised broilers. It says on here that these broilers are raised cage-free. Now, where I come from, that's misleading if you can't do it. It's like saying I'm not a murderer on, on a label on my chest. I, I know I'm, it's stating the obvious. All vegetarian fed, that's fantastic. It's a chicken, just so we all understand. Poultry are omnivorous. They eat the same diet as we do, and one of my oldest farmers is sat in the back of the room, one of the leading proponents of sustainable ag, Will Harris, with the, with the shine coming off its head. It's the worry of knowing me. Um, Will is working on a project where he'll start feeding uh, larvae to, to his chickens in a truly sustainable way. And humanely raised, well, if you call taking a genetic profile that normally in nature would take 17 to 22 weeks to reach sexual maturity, i.e. weight, you could eat it. That's the general life of a chicken. It doesn't grow testicles until it's 20. Um, this animal will grow in 47 days. There's absolutely nothing humane or normal about what they've done to this chicken. And then to cap it off, and this is a piece of work that came to my attention when I was at Whole Foods, um, a lot of people believe the USDA are a good organization. And I have to be honest with you, generally they are. But there is a massive consumer trust in the word USDA. We trust them. And this product is apparently humanely raised, raised in a system that it was never raised in in the first place. It's fed a diet that it actually doesn't do very well on and understand there's a lot of lysine and methionine in the diet, which is why we have to use soy. You know that really sustainable plant product, soy? The one that's wrecking the rainforest and is genetically modified to a different end and being spread with as many herbicides and pesticides. But we then feed soy to our chicken. And to tap it all, the USDA, through a process of application, there is no third-party oversight, have allowed their seal to be put on the front. So I'm looking at a BS label. And then just let's go to the top. And I'm going to make everybody jump a little bit. Natural, despite what Avashi says and her team says, is, it is, does have a definition. The USDA have defined natural as it appertains or as it pertains to meat. And if you look at all natural at the top, it's got a beautiful little star. Now, in England, we call those asterisks. And what that means is go to the back of the packet, because you're just being misled. They just played a trick on you. Because in this context, natural means minimally processed. No more, no less. So this animal could have been, as it says, raised indoors, fed the most horrific diet, fed to grow as fast as it could grow, gone through a slaughter plant where nobody has any idea whether it's alive or dead when it goes into the boiling pot to have its feathers taken off it, and sprayed with anything you want and still be natural as far as the USDA are concerned. That is their definition of it, and it just has to go away. But this is a meaningless label on an industrial product but designed to confuse you and make you pay more money for it. And Andrew, just to follow up, uh, how representative would you say this is? Of uh, How many companies are using this label in this way? And also, I mean, we know that Will talked a little bit about price point, and um, we know that consumers are, are, are really interested in higher welfare products. They're probably willing to pay a little bit more for them. So um, is this sort of a classic bait and switch kind of situation? I think for a nation as intelligent as America, we seem to have gone back to our snake oil salesman days. We believe any BS that goes on a packet. And I've just noticed on the bottom of this one, it says no hormones or steroids added. And again, it has now a little asterisk at the end of it. I'll just finish that off. It's against federal regulations to feed added hormones or steroids to poultry. So they are telling you they're not doing something that's illegal. I thought we were bright enough, but it's, it's commonplace, and the issue, and it burns, and we were talking about this last night, 
We've decided that family farmer, we, is a great nomenclature. All of Tyson's farmers are pretty much family farmers. And now Tyson is spinning family farmers. Natural is another phrase that came from the same place. So we just have to be very careful as advocates for change what it is we're asking our consumers to buy. So, um, Carter, can you talk a little bit about the role of litigation and the push for meaningful labels and, and what consumers can do? Honestly, I think a fifth of this room could go out, uh, buy products, then do a little research on those food products, realize they've been misled, and bring litigation that would change those labels. I don't think I'm being, I don't think I'm overstating uh, how much misleading advertising is out there and how effective litigation can be. And I think it's, it's in a way, the, the right to bring these lawsuits is like going to the ballot box when you vote. Because you're going to vote with your wallets when you go to the grocery store. And you're going to vote to, to determine what the world will look like based on your purchases, environmentally, worker justice, animal welfare. By intervening between you and that vote, by putting up a veil of false advertising, that you can't take down through litigation or some other means that you can access. You're basically being prevented from voting with your wallet to change the world in a way that you want to see it changed, and in some cases, and perhaps given the advent of climate change, to save the world. So uh, protecting your right to take down the veil through litigation in order to let the market itself improve conditions, that's vital. And uh, as I said, all of the three examples of misleading advertising regarding uh, eggs, foie gras, uh, and other products, these, these have been cured by simple consumers like yourselves that went out and got a lawyer, changed the advertising, and in some cases made money doing it. Talking about antibiotics here, um, antibiotics has gotten a lot of attention over the past few years especially, thanks in part to Consumer Reports and other advocates. Um, but just to um, paint a little bit of a picture of it, the FDA has known for about 40 years about the public health impacts or the public health risks associated with the misuse of antibiotics in animal agriculture. Um, and policy has been introduced on the federal level many times. Um, but, but let's talk about this. Um, so this slide specifically, I'm having a hard time seeing it here. Um, it, basically, consumers think that um, animals raised, or meat products that um, were raised with antibiotics should be labeled as such, which I think that we're all probably in agreement that that is, that's, that's true. Um, so Will, can you, um, you treat your animals with antibiotics sometimes, right? It's, it's a very rare case. Uh, in seven years, I've only had three, four animals I've had to treat with antibiotics. And Actually, technically, most of those were either due to something re related to transport. So the, the better part about it is they were treated with a therapeutic dose. Again, you know, I mentioned this earlier. And we'll, we'll go back and talk about Representative Louise Slaughter, who's brought these bills to Congress. Yeah. I've spoken with her on many occasions and also spoken beside her to Congress about the subtherapeutic use of antibiotics. So that's a key component. I'll, I'll go back again to the, you know, the children in school. When we send our kids to school, you know, essentially they are a small herd. <laughs> they, they work themselves together, they get together, they gather, and we all call that the, the advent of cold season. The number one thing you wouldn't do is send your kid to school every day taking just a little bit of antibiotic, <laughs> right? We wouldn't just give them just enough to think it's gonna hold it off. But what we would do is when your child gets sick, you take your child to the doctor and you get a therapeutic dose of antibiotic and you run the course with that to take care of it. It will run its course through your system, everything will be okay and we move on with our lives healthy as, as happy as can be. The same is said when we talk about animal welfare. If you give an animal a subtherapeutic dose of it, all you're doing is strengthening that organism for the next time it ever comes in contact with it, which could potentially be our, us on the plate. So only treating these animals when necessary. And of course, as you see, I've had three or four animals in total, only hundreds that have run across my farm in seven years that I've had to actually treat. Right. So that tells me something. Yeah. And I can pretty much probably, if I really thought about it, pinpoint exactly what the conditions were 
that the animal got sick from. Those are very simple things to kind of move and correct and everything else. But the most important thing is any animals that are given those antibiotics are given that therapeutic dose and given a course of time to let that run through their system, the same way we would allow a, a therapeutic dose of antibiotics to run through ourselves. Right. So let's talk a little bit about, um, I want to ask Andrew here about uh, the difference between uh, no antibiotics, because that's something that we're seeing on a lot of packages now, and um, this therapeutic uh, or subtherapeutic use of antibiotics. And um, can you just kind of talk about the distinction in the marketplace? Yeah, happy to. I mean, it's, it's one of the most difficult conversations we're having right now, because obviously we're losing the efficacy of antimicrobial products in the marketplace, so we're not having antibiotics that work anymore. But that's not due to use, it's due to abuse. And when Fleming got the prize for designing antibiotics and finding them, and I think it was something like a Nobel Peace Prize, something sort of low down the prize totem pole, uh, and I'll paraphrase, he said, one day an idiot is going to misuse these things and they're never going to work again. He didn't say any of those things. I think he said, <laughs> one day a foolish man will underdose and they'll not be effective anymore. This is the guy that figured it out, warned us in 1946 that if we don't take care of this stuff, it ain't going to work anymore. And when we give this little subtherapeutic dose, it messes with the microbia in the animal's gut and improves the ability to turn feed into meat, and that's the profit space. But removing them doesn't achieve very much if you're looking at a sustainable food system. Because what will then happen is the animals that do use antibiotics head off into one part of the massive company's production system, and then they head off to people who can least afford to eat rotten food, and the other side that hasn't been treated is heading towards the food elite. We then have an antibiotic-free label, and the challenge with an antibiotic-free label is antibiotics don't stay in muscle meat. If there is anything on the outside of the meat you have, it will be a bacteria from processing. It's not going to be inside the meat. That where it isn't where antibiotics live. So it's a whole meaningful series of outcomes, when the reality is if we could control treat only sick animals, and please don't think the FDA regulation is going to change anything. The head of Pfizer stated when he was asked, is the FDA rule going to impact your company, he guaranteed he will not sell less antibiotics. He still sees the market there, because what's going to happen is they're going to stop treating for growth, and they're going to treat for disease prevention which is now the new phrase we have to be aware of, disease prevention. Well, here's a cunning plan. It's a really, really big idea. How about we design a system that doesn't make animals sick? Yeah. How about we work on a way forward? <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate the round of applause because I, I love my soapbox, but it, it's... <laughs> uh, my TED piece was about the unintended consequences of chicken production. We're very intelligent people. And every time, or very intelligent non-human or human animals, depending on your phrase, we overcome problems and challenges in the best way we can. And we're very good at that, but we don't think what will happen the next day. So when we designed a system to bring chickens indoors, it's incredibly efficient on taking grain and turning it into meat. But it will make the animals sick. There's no two ways about that. You have a 90-degree room with 86% humidity and an animal that eats its own poo. When you were in your class at school with biology, because I think that was the last time I did it any sense, that was a good place to breed bacteria. So let's just design a system that doesn't make them sick in the first place. And Will's at it. Will's at it. Many great farmers are at it. That's our solution. Yeah. Carter, what's to be done on the legal front around antibiotics? Well, there's already been litigation over some of the claims, um, but the Animal Legal Defense Fund is actually pushing now a petition with the USDA. It's got 160,000 signatures on change.org that would require a, a three-level labeling system where it was, you would simply disclose whether the animals were raised without antibiotics, whether they were raised with 
antibiotics meaning non-therapeutic, or whether they were raised with antibiotics just for therapy. So you'd know all three categories, and the wording would be uh, hammered out so that we're not, we're not misleading consumers in any way. I mean, the, it's, the Animal Legal Defense Fund promotes a vegan diet, so it's not necessarily helpful for, for um, our supporters. We find our clients get particularly nervous when they know that we're sizing them up for dinner after consultation. So uh, it, but when people are purchasing meat and poultry products, they've got the opportunity to head off what's probably the biggest public health disaster facing this country and potentially the world. They can do that through their purchases, but they can't do that if they don't know what they're buying. So it's a simple thing, and I mean, I appreciate that Andrew likes the USDA to some degree, but I'll note that this agency, which is funded by your taxpayer dollars and appointed by people that you elected, hasn't even uh, taken the time to act in any meaningful way on the petition that would just require disclosure of you supporting this production process. These people are really in the pocket of industry, in my opinion. Okay, so this next chart um, kind of gets to the heart of, of what people care about when they're, when they're looking, when they're shopping for food, right? And um, better living conditions for animals and reducing antibiotic use in food are, they're not at the top of the list, but they're still, those are still huge, huge numbers of people. Um, so, Will, uh, what's been your experience with what's been your experience with the reaction to your product, and also on a personal level as a father and an athlete, um, can you talk about kind of your your own concerns in this area? Well, I think there's, you know, even as this room is here, I mean, all of you here are already showing me exactly the importance of what I'm doing, the importance of putting those products out there. You know, both Will and myself are, are in that same space. Um, you know, the ability to, to move into some larger retail space and, and to understand that there's a growing uh, consumer need and, and the educated consumer is ever growing and wanting the services, uh, the products that are, that are produced. You know, as a father, I, I look at it from, the, again, the standpoint of, I want my kids to understand where their food comes from, what, how it's produced and how it should be produced. I, I go in to see, speak at schools and it's sad to hear, you know, kids find out what I, that I have a farm and they're like, oh, that's awesome, what's going on? I'm like, well, do you know where your chicken come, comes from? And, they, and the first kids at the times, they scream out, Publix. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and they tell me it comes from the back. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what's before it gets to the back? I don't know, but it's sitting outside. <laughs> so, so, you know, to, to really gather all that, I mean, I look at it and go, how? How can we change that? And how can, you know, that's important to me to educate not just the consumer, but put great things on the table, you know, to, to change the family environment. We all look at the, the Sunday meal. No matter what level you are socioeconomically, the one thing that's always concern is, I should say the one thing that's always beneficial has been the family meal. No matter where you are socioeconomically, there's always a opportunity to put one solid meal on the table and I've seen time and time again that wherever it is it's almost always trying to choose the best possible options and when and you're talking about my athletic environment I can't tell you how many times I have teammates of mine who bring products to me or ask me about something or where can I get this or do you know who's who's raising that or doing this because they're looking for the same problem they're you know they're trying to answer the same problem how can we feed how can I feed not just myself but my family in a great way. And I, kind of to reiterate something again that, that Tara said this morning about um, industry's tendency to co-opt words that they know that consumers are interested in. I think that this really opens up kind of a, a huge opportunity for, for that type of um, misleading behavior. Um, and I want to talk about something that maybe the audience, some of the audience knows about, but. Um, I know that McDonald's is working uh, on sustainable beef, um, putting together kind of a, a system for sustainable beef. They're saying that all of their beef supplies will be um, sustain sustainable within the next few years, right? And we're, we've talked a lot about natural and um, humane, but um, Andrew, can you talk a little bit about this, this program? What, and how do you think it's gonna go? 
It's going to be the biggest misleading uh, project in industrial history. Um, in saying that, I think the fact that McDonald's, JBS, if you know who JBS are, they're the largest meat company on the planet, and they're predatory and growing, Cargill, Tyson, the fact they get in a room, which they have a lot of lawyers there because they're not allowed to be in the same room to avoid competitive practices, but they still manage it. The positive is they're thinking about it and they've called it the Sustainable Beef Roundtable. So theoretically, they're having a really long look at a sustainable supply chain. But a friend of mine recently said that if you're 100% bad and you make a 50% improvement, you are still 50% bad. Their system is predicated on the so-called sustainability of confinement feeding, where we take grain that humans can eat and we feed it to a herbivore ruminant and very inefficiently turn it into meat protein. And they're going to try and tidy up, and we had a picture earlier, feedlots. So they're going to make them less toxic. But they're still toxic. But they're co-opting a word that we all own. We own sustainability. So I feel very strongly that this is just a greenwashing exercise to get from A to B for a company that's seen value or the need to change. And that may be what we're all doing. We're, there it is. I mean, those, uh, those lagoons down there, at the bottom of them is product you may not ever, ever put on the land because it will never be usable again. And they're going to make that more sustainable. Each one of those little black dots is a cow. It has 220 square feet in which to roam. You won't see a blade of grass on there. It's becoming sick and ill because of dust because the dust goes into its lungs and they're being treated with antibiotics for respiratory illness. Again, it's nose to tail, so if there is a bacterial infection, it's spreading around. And there are a number, sadly, of environmental organizations that rattle that we can make this more efficient and more sustainable, and they are buying into feedlots being a future. And if they don't start changing their minds, certainly AWA is going to start writing blogs about who they are and why they think the way they think, because that is not a sustainable solution to anything. It's yeah. Oh, and, and that was one of our photographs. We had the privilege of flying Jamie Oliver over some feedlots to ensure he didn't buy feedlot beef for his American restaurants. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I think we've just got a couple of slides left. Um, so th here's another really interesting one. Um, consumer perception of natural, just s similar to the humane label. Um, most people think that um, when, when something has a natural label on it, that there are no artificial growth hormones, no artificial ingredients, no GMOs in feed, um, no artificial ingredients again in feed, um, no antibiotics, and that the animals went outdoors. And a lot of... Um, times not so much with beef and feedlots, but other animals are never make it outside at all in their entire lives, right? Um, so again, the consumers really think almost 50% of uh, on every single one of these principles, they think that this is what it means. And, and even higher, a vast majority think that the natural label should mean these things. Um, Andrew already made a very strong case for the ban natural. Um, so uh, Carter, I'll just ask you to talk a little bit about, well, here we go. I mean, here's the things that we can do about it, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, uh, it, it's incredibly deceptive and it's incredibly pervasive. Um, and it speaks to what we want our products to look like, uh, probably more like, like Will's Farm than really what they are. And in that sense, places like the lagoons that you saw using terms like this, could, shouldn't be, I mean, it, it, it is as offensive as it could be to try to play to your best sensibilities to sell you a product that's probably, in essence, worthless. Yeah. All right, thank you. Good job, buddy.